Yeah. Holly knows that. Holly will know. Okay. So first of all, welcome again to uh, everyone who's come. I want to. I want to um, ask first of all, how many have ever read anything, done anything, know anything about feng shui? Lots of hands out there. So you're going to have a good time tonight, Elaine. Uh, our topic this evening is uh, a natural harmony using feng shui, feng shui to enhance how you tend your patch of the planet. That is kind of right in our wheelhouse of one garden at a time. Our speaker this evening is Elaine Anderson. She's the founder of Red Tortoise Feng Shui. She's a professional practitioner and she's been doing it for 25 years. She's certified in the contemporary style of black sec feng shui, which I've never heard of, and traditional compass school feng shui, which I have. Uh, she's a founding board member and president emerita of the Feng Shui Institute of the Midwest and a former faculty member of the Wind and Water School of Feng Shui. She's an avid gardener. She provides consultation and classes and workshops on Feng Shui in the home, garden, and landscape. And not surprisingly, she's also an oncology nurse with M Health Fairview Cancer Care in her spare time. And she's a certified holistic nurse with a broad clinical, administrative, and teaching experience. And with that, it is my pleasure, and I can't wait to hear her, uh, to turn the mic over to uh, Elaine Anderson and uh, hear about Feng Shui in our gardens. Thanks, Jeremy. Thank you, okay. Get my mic put on. Got it. Okay. This is being recorded. Now I've been... Duly noted. Okay, now, can you hear me at home? Just you let me know if someone can't hear me at home. Um, welcome, thanks for coming. I'm really happy to be here. And I think it's just perfect. In a way, I've been waiting for this talk for many years to bring native plants, prairie, together with the Chinese principles and art of feng shui. And so we're going to talk all about all things, all kinds of things. Um, Julie asked me if I have pictures of native plants, and I have pictures of plants from all over the world. So they might not all be from Minnesota, maybe not even very many of them, but we're really going to talk about concepts here and principles. So I want you to sort of like take your right brain, you know, that calculation and the accounting, you're all working on your taxes, right? That part and like just put set that aside, put it in your back pocket, because this is much more of left brain kind of approach. This is really going to be more about aesthetics and about thinking about principles and um, philosophies. And so we're going to just head into that. I am going to go as fast as I can. I'll have way too much to tell you. And so then sometimes people will say, hurry up. So. Now let me make my camera work here. All right. So just take a take a breath here. <clears throat> what is feng shui? Some of you have never really heard of this, never heard how to say it, feng shui. Um, it's really an ancient system to understand the energies of the cosmos, of the earth, of humans, of all these things as they are put together. Um, excuse me here. It's, it's actually part of the holistic system of Chinese medicine. So there are, are, are many arms of Chinese medicine. Acupuncture is one of them. Herbs, meditation, movement, lots of things. And feng shui is actually part of that. So in a in traditional feng shui, um, Chinese way, feng shui is part of a healthy lifestyle. And many, many cultures, almost every culture I've ever really looked into has some version some way of being in harmony with the environment, except for maybe our modern <laughs> American <laughs> culture. Vastu Sastra is in uh, Eastern, in, in India. Native Americans obviously had lots of ways to be in harmony with their environment. So we're talking about feng shui, which is the Chinese method of that. You don't have to be Chinese or even want to have a Chinese looking garden to learn from these philosophies. And this is the one that I know the most about, or I would also share other other symptoms. So it's really about creating environments that support us. And we practice feng shui to offer protection to, to ourselves and our families to support health and to enhance fortune and blessings. That's the way we uh, look at that. 
I always like to say what feng shui isn't. It's not a science. However, there has been more and more um, movement towards some scientific research around feng shui. Um, so, and sort of validating and ex the explanations of feng shui. It's not a religion. And sometimes people um, get nervous about feng shui and their religion. And I will just say that it, it really can be considered part of anybody's spiritual or intentional life practice. So it's very compatible and very amenable to any way that you approach life. And it's not a philosophy in the sense that it also has many practical tools and techniques um, along with it. So it's really a study of energetic patterning. And again, it's about the heaven, earth, and human relationship. So what do we do with feng shui in the garden? Probably if you've heard anything about feng shui, you've heard more about using it in your home, where to place your bed, what happens when your toilet's in the wrong place, how about the fireplace, et cetera. And we can talk about all of that, but not tonight. <laughs> um, and so what do we do with it in the garden? Well, actually feng shui started in the landscape because it started by how the Chinese people placed their ancestors, their dead relatives. And it, so it started by how bodies were buried. And the, the idea was if you put your ancestors, your, your relatives in a good place after they died with good feng shui, with good sun and orientation and wind and water, you would have happy ancestors and you would have a happy life so that it would relate. We're not as concerned about our ancestors in this culture um, but we do want to, we can take that to our own gardens. So what do we do with it? Well, there are several different things. You can enhance elements in your garden that reflect just principles of feng shui. And we'll talk about some specific ways to do feng shui in your garden and some more general ways. Also using feng shui principles and tools um, can, you can make very specific adjustments. And those might be based on surroundings, roadways, waters, and sort of a classic thing in, in feng shui is if you live at the end of a T intersection and you've got cars driving right towards your house all the time. So that's something where someone might want to make an adjustment. We could talk about that for the way the roadways are, the way um, traffic goes around other buildings. And then also you can make adjustments based on the feng shui bagua is what we call it, or our map, and how we address feng shui with our own personal intentions. I'm going to stop here because I just remembered I sent um, documents of handouts to Dan, and so those will be available to people. And I'm a lot of times we have paper docs, so I'm sorry if you're a note taker, because you don't have any paper to take notes on, <laughs> but there will be available. So we have four principles of feng shui um, that we go by. And I'll just go through these quickly because I'll get into each one. Everything is energy. Everything is qi, we call it, in, in, um, to, to Chinese or many Asian cultures, actually. The, the best way I can describe qi is think about how we think about the, maybe the word spirit, that there's this non-physical kind of energy that is in everything. And we think of it in our culture, probably more in live things. The plants have spirits, the people have spirits, animals have spirits. In the Chinese way of thinking, everything has chi or has energy. And you know, there's actually more and more in science looking at the energy, this stuff, the glue that holds all those subatomic particles together is actually energy. So this is, this is my scientific nursing brain uh, likes this approach. We use nature as our model. I'm going to emulate the aspects of nature and keep them in balance. We use we, your space reflects your life. And this is where this is kind of the fun of feng shui because we're looking at metaphors and how your space can reflect who you are as a person. What does it say about you? And intention matters. So being clear about our purpose and our intention. So again, everything is energy. So the words feng and shui mean wind and water. Feng means wind and shui means water. So now at the very least you learn two Chinese words tonight. It's based on a Taoist worldview in which everything contains energy or chi and we want chi or energy to flow freely. We, if it's allowed to stagnate or if it accelerates too fast, then that creates unhealthy effects like 
poverty or bad luck or illness. So we we want our the energy to flow freely. And you know, you think about in your garden, how you want sort of the traffic to flow, how the energy to flow. Same thing inside your house. You know, if you have an interior designer, they're looking at the traffic patterns and the way things flow in your house. That's what we're talking about there. Uh, and again, this increasingly um, matches up with what science is finding us. So feng shui, wind and water. We want our chi to be more like a gentle breeze and maybe not so much like straight line winds. We, <laughs> We would like it to be more like a gentle prairie stream and not too much water. We don't want too much of anything and we don't want to have it to be there's nothing. So either one of those will create an imbalance. How do we use nature as our model? Well, there are several things and we could, I could spend you know, several days talking about the five element cycle. Um, so we're just gonna just briefly touch on yin and yang. Have you heard of yin and yang? So that's a pretty common thing. And those are sort of the, the um, continuum of different energies in our lives. And I'll talk a little bit more about how we talk about that in relation to the design of your garden. I mean, you can talk about yin and yang foods and we can talk about yin and yang personalities and we can talk about yin and yang organs of the body. It applies to lots of things, but we'll talk about it in a design sense. And we wanna encourage what's called sheng qi, which is positive qi. And we wanna avoid what's called shar qi, which would be poison arrows. We don't want things pointing at, at us. So yin and yang. The yin is really that cooler, calmer, quieter, darker kind of energy. You know that this hydrangea, you, can, you might be able to see this, that it's been dormant for all those months of winter. It doesn't mean there's no life, right? The life, you of all people understand this, the life goes down and deep and inside. And then when it's time for the spring to come back, it, the life comes up and out again. So that doesn't mean dead, but it means darker and more secret and more inner. Where yawn is when, this, we're just dreaming for this now, aren't we? <laughs> then the spring comes out and the green happens. And you know, we, we get, it, it, think about the energy. We think about, we call it spring fever. It's more, we have more heat. We have more sun. We have more energy. We have more liveness. We wear shorts, even when it's not that warm out, we go, you know, to the native plant store and buy way too many plants that sit on our porch and we have a hard time getting them in because we get so excited about it. So yin and yang. So these are these design principles. Um, the yin is darker, cooler and colder, more sort of passive and quiet. In general, we talk about this as a feminine characteristics, curved and rounded shapes, horizontal lines are considered um, yin in terms of the, the design, ornate and small kinds of designs, the nighttime, the moon, the earth, the earth, I mean the ground and the earth, and water, water has an asterisk, I'll talk about that in a minute, but in general, water is considered yin. Yan, light and bright, warm and hot, active, loud, masculine, geometric and angular shapes, vertical lines, large, large versus small. So again, these are all in re relation to each other, the daytime, the sun, the heaven, mountains, all considered yon. So when we're looking at a thing, something that's just there, it's the same in every way, except for one is really small and one is really big. Then when we're looking at yin and yon, then that small thing has more yin energy than the bigger one. So the, it's all in relation to each other. Then it's not um, a solid thing that can be measured. So water, lots of us want to have some kind of, I'm sorry, this is hard to, there we go. Okay, here we go, water. Uh, I'm sorry, I want to go back one. Maybe I don't. <laughs> I guess we do. Okay, so water. Water has many characteristics, and you can see from the different pictures that water can, again, it, generally, it's it's got yin energy. It can be very quiet and calming, it, and yet, with a little more activity, it still can be gentle, but it can also be very powerful, uh, and it can be more assertive, and so you can see that you know, this kind of, or if this is at the landscape arboretum, you know, just a really quiet, calm stream. 
it's shady, it's cool. That's a very yin setting. Where this one out here, there it's more out in the sun, there's bigger boulders, there's some activity. You can kind of hear that fountain going. So there's more energy to that, more yawn energy. And then we get back to the to the arboretum. This thing has a lot of lively energy. So this is a very powerful, has much more yawn energy. It goes upright, it's tall. It can really help deflect incoming traffic. It, it's actually right in the middle of this huge um, corridor of space out in the garden. So it can really def deflect a lot of energy from, from the traffic. So water can be all kinds of things. And that's why I mentioned that. Your space reflects your life. This principle, again, it's kind of the where the rubber meets the road in feng shui. What is your space saying about you? I'm guessing that as you have gotten interested in, in working with native plants, that that in and of itself and the way you work with them says a lot about who you are, that, that that's what you want to express to people and to yourself as who you are. So we're looking for metaphors in our life and our space. Uh, we want our environment to be able to support us and um, to, so to help us be in balance and harmony. So we want our land and our ecosystems to be in balance and harmony. And with feng shui, what we feel like is then that also helps us be in balance and in harmony internally. So again, it can be expression of where you are and where you're planning on going not so much where you are from. Uh, and we always, this is also the nurse in me, we always want to provide safety and security first before we start adding on a lot of extra, extra enhancement of blessings. I always say, you know, if you have a crumbling walk and step to your front door, like that's more important to fix than adding some purple flowers out back because that represents money. See what I'm saying? Like we, you know, safety and security. So here's your five minute feng shui class. So this is all the time we, we had. In the late mid nineties, we went on a trip, my husband and twin boys who were maybe 11, 12. I'm looking at Cindy because her daughter was on that trip. Oh, really that old. Okay, well, so anyway, we went on a trip with a group to Scotland. And um, one of the places we went to was just amazing. Is it somewhere? Eventually, I found this online in the middle of Scotland. There's this thing called the Fairy Glen, and it's in a place called Rosemarkey, Scotland. I had no idea where I was at the time because I just would ride on the bus and we went there. And we had this lovely walk through this glen, it's not a big area. And we got to this beautiful waterfall. And those, um, these things sticking out of the log are actually coins that people stick in the log and make a wish. It's, so it looks, it's really cool. And the fairy glen is called that because the people around there, maybe the children, maybe the adults, believe that fairies live in this glen. And so you would walk along and then there would be a little place where someone had left little presents and they tied ribbons and it was so sweet and magical. It was just a wonderful little place. Um, so we had a lovely day, of course, it's Scotland and that means it's still raining and there's still midges, which are like mosquitoes only smaller and they can get through mosquito netting. So there's that, but it was lovely. So then we all climb on the bus and we're tired and we're kind of wet. And now we're going to the next place we're staying and we would drive along and you'd get kind of to a corner and there'd be some sort of castle-y looking place. And you'd think maybe this is where we're staying. And then it would keep going. <laughs> and then you'd go along some more. And then this is where we ended up. <laughs> it's called the Gerlock, because the Gerlock was across the street, Sands Hotel. Um, how excited do you think I am about this? <laughs> now, so why? Tell me why I, I'm not excited about this. It's a downer. <laughs> it's the first time I heard that. It's you. Say it. It's you. It's yin. Well, yeah, it's yin. But there's no balance. There's no balance. That's right. There's no balance. There's this is. Nothing there's nothing pretty. In the the planters, these white things along the front were planters that had nothing living in them. I'm going to give you a clue. If you maybe some of you have been to Scotland, uh, it where it says self catering apartments. It's really a backpacker hotel motel, which they didn't really tell us before we went. Um, so you like you had to bring your own towels, which we didn't have. We did have sleeping bags, 
And my son, one time when I was getting ready for this, he said, remember mom, we had to put in money in the machine to get heat in our room. Okay, so, you know, this is, and okay, metaphors. How welcoming does this sign seem? Does it? Not really. So this is what we're talking about. So, okay, we stayed there for a few days and we did some more hiking things. And now we went to the next place. And the next place was on the Isle of Skye. And that sound cool, just by itself. Isle of Skye in a little town called Portree. And this is the hotel that most of us stayed in, in our trip. And our, our, it was a big bus. Um, tiny. <laughs> crowded our room was way up at the top in the in the roof line and, we, and our sons are big they <laughs> Cindy can tell you that too it was really crowded and there was it was so full that not everybody could stay in that hotel so some people had to haul their bags down the hill I don't know a half a mile or something towards the harbor all the way down and where they ended up was this place so how do we feel about this? Yeah. Yes, why? Why do we like this one better? Well, it's well, it's is there's color? It's welcoming. it's welcoming, exactly. And it says the little sign, it says, welcome to the pink guest house. And so that's exactly, like, that's five minute feng shui right there. If you care about your space and if you make it, put some energy in it too, that you are, care about it, make it welcoming. This place was so sweet on the inside, also taught tiny, but it was like visiting your Scottish grandmother. You know, it was like upholstered chairs and doilies. I went over to have tea with one of the, one of our friends. But if that's all you could do with feng shui, just making it beautiful in your own way, making it you in your own way, making it welcoming for the people that come to you. Now we can get into more detail. <laughs> Applying the principle of your space reflects your life. So this is kind of just what I said. One way to do that is to fix what's broken. And that might be the light bulbs, which things my husband says takes three weeks to figure out how to do and about 10 minutes to actually do. Um, removing clutter. Clutter means to clot. That's with the it's a middle English word to clot. So as a nurse, you know, clotting is a really important thing when it's really small. <laughs> and when it gets really big, it causes all kinds of trouble. And that's exactly the way clutter has been. Um, well, what do you mean by clutter in the garden? Well, seasonal debris, you know, again, here in a month or so, we're going to have a ton of that that we have to figure out is how to get rid of that. Um, overdone decorations. Does anybody in your neighborhood have 75 gnomes in their yard? Or, you know, there's that. Um, tools and equipment strewn around. Uh, uh, somebody I've read, Dana White, has written books about decluttering, and she calls it procrasta clutter, yeah. which I think is a really good word. So again, keeping what's what represents to you where you're going, and not so much where you've been. You know, you have those things like, wow, my mother-in-law gave me that thing with the, the giraffe that's in my front yard, and I feel like I have to keep it like. It's not really good feng shui when you know, and so keeping where you want to be going and not so much where you've been. Um, and you can still love history, you can still keep things that your roots, you know, it's it's not around that, but you don't want things to be sort of dragging a yoke around your neck. So we do we make feng shui adjustments. I might have mentioned that already once. What do I mean by adjustments? What is an adjustment? Well, there are several different ways. Sometimes what an adjustment does, and we'll talk about what I mean, what do we do? What, what is an adjustment? But why do we make them? Sometimes we're adding energy or movement. It's a place that's maybe too stagnant for us, and we want to add some energy. It's too plain. It's boring. It's stagnant. It, 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 nothing happens there. Sometimes that's where clutter collects <laughs> in our space um, because it's stagnant. Or we can be reducing energy or movement. Um, we, things that are moving too fast. Maybe that might be that part of the front yard where the cars are, you know, coming straight at, at your house because you live on the end of the T intersection. So reducing energy and movement. And it could be balancing, working to balance energy. Also deflecting or correcting a chi problem that we have diagnosed. Um, enhancing a specific life aspect. So this is where we get into more of the intentional aspects of feng shui is that I'll show you how you can find 
aspects of your life and how you can make adjustments around those. And sometimes that's just anchoring and reminding you of your intentions. So these are ways to adjust and just energy. Now, one of your documents is a whole page of a lot more detail of these kinds of things. And I won't go into every one of them, but just so you can see, there are a lot of ways to make adjustments. If you've read anything about feng shui, you probably heard about mirrors because we kind of call mirrors the aspirin of feng shui. And those are used a lot inside, but I even use mirrors in my garden and outside. Also, crystals is another thing that people hear a lot about in those uh, maybe not use as much in the garden, um, but light, bright objects that can be lights, it can be torches, it can be mirrors because they reflect light, sound, wind chimes and bells and water can be a sound feature. Living objects, those are just inherently, um, inherently you're adjusting with those. Moving objects, windmills, uh, waterfalls again, uh, the water, that takes some energy, some <clears throat> maintenance to keep that going. Um, heavy objects, colors, we'll talk about some of those colors, and you can get very specific traditional Chinese cures. And then that last one, number eight, most of all, is the th things that you come up with on your own. And there are lots of times people come up with uh, something that they just thought up, like, well, whoa, we could do this, and this would mean this for us. And so um, we can talk about those two. And then the final, the final of the principles, intention matters. So you know, I think we've talked here about an intention quite a bit. Energy follows thought. Um, we want you to have just to add some some power to your intentions, to your adjustments. Is having clear goals. This is basic, you know, um, brain chemistry. Having clear goals, having some using some visualization. If you meditate, meditating on something that you're wanting and speaking your intentions out loud. You know, in the beginning was the word. You know that that. A vibration of sound. You know how when you maybe thinking about going back to graduate school, or maybe you're thinking about losing some weight, and it's just muddling inside, and then you tell somebody and you say it, and now China has a life of its own. Now it's been said and it's out there. So that's why when we have intentions, we want to speak them out loud. Mm -hmm. This is another one of your handouts that you that you can print off. This is called the Bagua. Couple new Chinese words. Ba means eight. And gua are the areas. There's eight areas around the middle. Traditionally, this would look like an octagon or round. And, and traditionally, there would be a compass in the middle. And all of these would be associated with a direction. And again, I've been trained in more than one school of feng shui. And what I'm doing today is we're talking about more of a contemporary way of looking at it because it's easier and we can talk about it in a short period of time. And the principles are all the same. If you wanna get into it and learn more about traditional feng shui and you have a few years to learn it, then you can do that. So I'm gonna go briefly around like, well, how do, oh, I'm gonna go ahead first and show how do we use this thing? This is a template for how we would lay over our space and look at what are the meanings, the life area meanings in our space. So let's pretend that this is your lot. And there's your driveway and a parking lot. I don't know, this came from a book, this English book, but it's Chinese, but don't worry about that. This is your lot. And there's a lot line. So when I'm gonna put this bagua over, it can stretch and fit the, the lot. It's gonna go like this. And you can see already that there might be some little, like there's pieces that are missing, pieces that are sticking out. So that as a feng shui consultant, then we analyze what's going on there and do we need to do anything about that? This is pretty basic, it's pretty simple. So let's say that this is your lot. You live on a, anybody live on a cul-de-sac? You've got this purse shaped lot. So here's your lot line, it's going way out into the wetland behind you. And now we're gonna put this bagua on that. And you can see that it stretches and though now we definitely have some like it's a missing piece here and there's a little extra bonus points of, of what we call an extension on part of it. So you might think, why would I ever, why would someone ever need a, con a feng shui consultation? Well, it might be something like this where you, there's a lot you can do on your own. 
lot of books you can read, but sometimes it gets a little complicated. And that's where you might want to bring in somebody to help you sort of try to figure, figure it out a little bit more when it's a tricky floor plan or when there are other things involved. So now I'm going to go back to the Bagua. Here we go. We're orienting this to the entrance to the space and your lot, that's usually your driveway or your walkway from your front where the address is. If you have um, an alley in the back and you always go in the back, but your address and the front of your house and the street, you're going, you're going to take the front of it is where the architecturally intended front of the building, not the door you go in all the time, which might be the backyard. So we're taking it from the front door. And so it's just oriented that way. And I'm going to start in the middle and we're just going to go around a circle. What do they mean? I'm going to give you like a one sentence on what they mean. The career area, this is about your, your journey in life. So we have elements and colors and themes of this. This is about your journey. You might be retired and then, but you have what, maybe native plants is your new journey and your new passion in life. Um, but it could be that you still have a career. If you're a student, it, then you're a student, then that's your career. And we use the color black because that's the color that we use in the Chinese use for the color for water. It could be dark blue also. Then as we move around to the side, um, knowledge and wisdom. This area is about self-cultivation. It's about how you improve yourself. And so that can be intellectually, it can be spiritually, it can be anything you're doing to improve yourself. And that area, we use a blue or blue-green color, and that is an earth kind of element. You can go get into more of those, but just to give you the, the short rundown. The next one up in the middle, family and community. This is about your roots. It's about your ancestors. It might, if you came from a small town sometimes, or a church group, sometimes those, those really those roots that you come from, but for sure family and ancestors. <clears throat> we use the color green and the element of wood for that. In the back left-hand corner is wealth and power. We use the color purple for that. That also is a wood element. All of these colors are options for you. If you happen to hate purple, then I wouldn't want you to use purple in, any, in anything. There are always options. In the back in the middle is fame and reputation. This is about how the world views you. You may not be trying to get famous unless you're writing a book or becoming a, a movie star, <laughs> but you probably do want to have a good name in the community. You want your neighbors to think well of you. If you own a business, you want, or you're a customer of a business, you want people to think highly of you. So this is where we look at that fame and reputation. And that's a fire area. And we use the color red for that. Over on the back side, on the right-hand side is partnership and commitment. Some books just call it the marriage area. You don't have to be married, but it's about primary partnerships. I have identical twin sons. And so I explained to them when they were young that for them, especially being young, that they have their relationship is represented in that corner because that's a primary partnership in their life, whether they want it or not some days, but that's a primary partnership. The color for that is pink and the element for this is earth. Now, I, pink is the color people have the strongest opinions about, it seems. They love it, they hate it. So what I always like to remind you is we're talking about any shade, not just the color that's on the slide there. And some of you are probably old enough to remember laughing, maybe not all of you, where they would say, we're all pink on the inside. And I love that because I'm a nurse and it's actually true <laughs> that everyone's pink on the inside. And so I think of it as an intimate color, as a human color. And that's what we're going for there in that. That's the most yin of all the areas. Then down in the middle on the right-hand side, it's children and creativity. This is about what the legacy you build. So it could be your children, but maybe you don't have children or maybe you, you don't want that, but you, maybe you want to write a book or maybe you're leaving a garden for someone. So it's whatever you're creating. So in this, in the fam, thinking about family, your generation and your children, that is represented in children and creativity and the grandchildren where the family and community, that's more your ancestors. Do you have a question? Yeah, two questions. Just in terms of the color, are you saying that you should use the particular color at issue more? You can. 
or is it just representing these ideas as practice? So I will, I will. So the question is, do we use these colors to en make enhancements to this or are those representing sort of just the concept, right? right. So, and so what I would say is that these colors ma match up to a certain degree to the elements that are represented in these areas. So there is a representation piece and you can use that to make an adjustment to add more to it. Like I want to, I want to write this book. I want to be more creative. I might find something white or use something white or silver reflective because it's a metal area to put that in my space to help remind me of my intention to add energy to that intention that will bring that energy of metal and creativity. So it's kind of both of those things. Yes. And again, if you hate pink, you don't want to put pink back in your bedroom, you know, so then we can we can find other colors for things. And then down in the front, helpful people and travel. This one is really sort of everything that everybody that wasn't in the partnership area lands in helpful people. It's your neighbors. It's your friends. It's your students. It's your teachers. It's your colleagues. It, it, everybody in your life can sort of how those relationships can be represented in that helpful people area. Why travel? Because you need helpful people in your life to get to travel. You need people to drive the buses and fly the planes and help give you directions when you're stuck in the German subway and that kind of thing. So you want helpful people. Not color is gray and metal. So that's a lot of information. I don't expect you to remember all of it at once. And what I say is that when we look at that Bagua, I'm also going to give you some more general ways to use feng shui in your garden. But so you can lay that out over your garden and say, you know what? In my life, I have an issue with money and I want to enhance that in my life. So there are lots of things you can do. You could like remember to go to work. That, yeah. that helps. <laughs> but you could also, if I want to work on kind of a metaphorical way, if I want to work in a, a symbolic way, I can look at that back left corner of my space, of my lot, and say, is there some way that I could bring this energy into that area? Because that area is an energetic representation of that part of my life. Also, inside the house can do the same thing so they can be layered. So that's how we use that. So that can be very specific. And I don't want anybody to try to fix all nine areas. You look at your life and think, what's, what's up for me? My relationships or my creativity? Oh, and the thing I forgot to mention, which I get a demerit for is the center <laughs> health <laughs> health is we call it the tai chi area or the health area this is about your health and your centeredness health in every way physical emotional mental spiritual every way and and the balance of that and the color is yellow and that is for the for the element of earth um, we want to honor that now that can be tricky in the garden because a lot of times in a city lot, the middle of your lot is underneath your house, you know, because so you can't always, it isn't always easy to honor the middle the same way you might honor the middle of your home, the geographic center of your home. But sometimes you can, and sometimes there might be a deck and it's like, I can have a pot of yellow flowers or I can have a yellow boulder, whatever. We can make an adjustment there to honor that, to remind us and we see that and think, oh, okay, I'm going to take a breath here and remember to be centered. Okay. And yeah. The Bible, I love using the Bible, and it seems to be property centered. Uh, is it possible to use it just in your garden? You know, yes. Use it down yes. Stuff? Yes. So the question is it, that I'm looking at the whole property. Ah, hang on. I've, I've put it over the whole property. Similar like how I would put it over a whole house or a whole building, but you can layer the bagua. So you can you might have a, a room in your garden and then put the bagua over that room of your garden. Um, and it could be over the front yard. The, sometimes those aren't as defined um, as well, but yes, you can absolutely do that. Yes, and it's the same way inside your house. You can do it over the whole house. You can do it over just your bedroom, just your office. You can do it just over your desk. So you can go crazy. Some people do it in their cars. I'm, I'm, no, we won't go there. <laughs> so we come from the earth. We return to the earth in between. All right. So 
Now we're going to talk about ways, more general ways to have a feng shui garden. These are elements of a garden that probably many of you already have in your gardens, um, but they're just lovely ways to kind of enhance that. So we start with the entrance. We start with the front door of your home because that is where your yin world, your in internal world meets your yang world, your outside world. And that front door, we call that the mouth of chi. It's extremely important whether you're doing feng shui in your garden or feng shui for your home. It's very important. And we want a front door that is welcoming that because your opportunities symbolically, metaphorically are gonna come to you through your front door. What if you don't use your front door? especially in the winter, right? So we want you to use your front door. We want you to unlock it and shovel the snow, make your neighbors, make your friends come in, like close your garage door and make them come in the front door because you want chi to come in your door. Sometimes when you're feeling good, you might park your car in your garage and then walk outside and walk around and go in your front door and bring that good chi with you into your front door. You can see that when you have a door that's the same color as your house, sometimes you can't control the color of your door. I understand that townhomes and HOAs where they won't let you pick a color, but you can see it kind of disappears, right? Where a red door, because red, Chinese, red, red. <laughs> I told my husband, I was wearing a Buffalo plaid to a feng shui meeting. This is a first, I just have to say that. Let's go with that. Um, but it's so Minnesota, right? So Minnesota feng shui. Anyway, in China, how many of you have been to China? Did you see any red front doors? Pretty much all of them. Because, because not only is red, you know, red does a lot of things. And in science, when they've studied color, red is the color that humans react to the most. Humans are most drawn to the color red. Red is lucky, red is happy. Red are, these are the associations people have with red. Also across the world, red is protective. What color is a stop sign or a warning sign? Red across the world. So you want that front door being red, it is welcoming and it's also protective. So it does two things. Do you have to have a red front door? No, it can be a red that you love any shade of red that you love from orange to pink to purple. But you know, you might not want a red door. So you want a color that you love. And we always like to say, you want a color that actually you look good in so that when you're standing by your door, you look good. You don't want a color that drains you out and you look terrible if you're by your front door. And again, just metaphors. So, you know, the tree that's planted three feet in front of the door that is so recessed and dark that you can't even see it, just can't even get into the door. Sometimes it's just too much of a good thing. <laughs> you know, so just thinking about those metaphors is, is my front door, is it welcoming? Is it a friend of mine went to Ireland and she knew I love front doors. And I love this because to me, you, first of all, you'd never see this in the United States, right? Because they always want all the doors the same. I think the red one stands out the most. But anyway, it, 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 they all have personality. Now, we also want the walkway, the, the way to get to the entrance to be as welcoming as possible. And this is from South Minneapolis. Sometimes those are, it look, it is steeper than it looks. And it's a straight shot. And I could say, well, you should tear up your whole front yard and you should build planter beds and you can do all, and make your stairs curving which would cost thousands of dollars and they would just get rid of me as a consultant. But what about if we just put some pots of flowers or something, maybe they're not big gardeners. You could put a border along that's curving that would soften that edge, soften the entrance way. You could also put pots of flowers and I would put them like alternate them so that your energy that of your eye, any designer can tell you this, would it would makes a flowing path out of a perfectly straight, Stairway. Now, if this is a carved wooden door, I'm not going to tell them to paint that red. It's beautiful, but maybe they have some red pots around it. So now this is a lovely stairway that's got some curving to it. So when you can kind of see how it just feels a little different, right? It just feels a little softer. This is a place in um, uh, Lanesboro. I always want to say Northfield. 
I love Northfield, this Lanesboro. And we were, we went for the weekend and this is, this is a bed and breakfast and we were walking along and I was taking feng shui pictures. And I thought, wow, like there's a parking lot here. And then you got to walk up this whole flight of stairs to get to your bed and breakfast. It's kind of this energy of, oh, this stairway. It's a lot of work to get here. But then when we just walked up the, up the road to a different gate, this is another way to get to that place. So does it feel different to you? Even without any decent landscaping. I mean, again, they could ask us to make this nicer landscaping and we could all do that, right? We all know exactly what we would do. But even that entryway, that soft curving path, different. The front door is not easy to see. This is a place we were staying. Mm -hmm. The... Oh, I'm going to forget the name of it, and I should tell you because it's amazing. It's still there. Anyway, the point of this one is that we walked up, and as beautiful as it is, and it's got amazing gardens. And the guy that ran it was a chef. It was incredible. I'll come up with a name for you because you'll get. You're going to want to know. But when I we walked up, we walked up this up the um, walkway, and then we didn't know which way to go, right? Because it splits off. It's very symmetrical, and. So we started going to the right, which was the wrong way to go because that's the kitchen door and really the front door is to the left. And so my point with this is as beautiful as it is, you want your opportunities and you want people to know exactly where your front door is. We don't want it to be confusing at all. And so if they had one of those little like white hand pointy signs or they do have the welcome sign over on the side, but it wasn't that simple. So again, just we wanna make it as clear as possible. And an entrance to your garden can also be that. So sometimes maybe we're talking about having a lovely gate. Anybody to Plymouth to the Millennial Garden? It's, it's lovely. You should go if you haven't been there. It's really great. So this is a previous house of mine and my front door, which was really great. When we bought it, it had a red front door. So that was a good sign. But eventually I decided it was too dark. It was kind of... It doesn't look that dark here, but it was kind of recessed and it was dark, so we needed a new red. And I spent about 40 hours one summer with the door on the, in an 85 degree garage. Anyway, well, I found a red that was called million dollar red. Like who wasn't want a front door called million dollar red? And that with a couple other colors of red and a couple colors of green and some purple and some very tiny brushes. We, um, and, the, and, the, and the storm door, but I love that. I, I enjoyed doing it. I love looking at it. And so that's where you can have some fun. You can have some fun with what you do. A moon gate is my goal in life to have a moon gate in the garden. Really they represent, they're just so beautiful. This circular design rising up out of the earth representing, they represent family wholeness and cohesiveness. They represent new birth and renewal. And, and also a connection with other planets and other worlds. They really have all kinds of symbolic meaning to them. Everybody needs a front door, including the fairies. Water, we talked about water a lot. You want to have water somehow in your garden. So there's lots and lots of ways to do that. You can have a giant pond and fountain. The ideal with feng shui, again, there's 5,000 years of detail here. So, you know, you, we, you can go really crazy with it. It's great if your water is near the front door. That's lovely. And especially if it's, you're looking out your front door on the left-hand side, that's even better. That it, that it has a flow to it, that it flows gently toward your door. So if you've got a fountain, and a lot of times people might make it sort of pointing out, it, the ideal is to have the flow of the water because that's chi and that's energy coming toward you. You want it to be clean and well maintained. If you can't take care of the pot, the fountain or the garden or whatever, or the pond, don't do it. You know, uh, algae filled dead fountain is really not great feng shui. <laughs> so, but also in our world, rivers and lakes out back, any water is great. You can see the water, it's lovely. This was a this was a, a pond in front of a previous home of ours, a different one than the Red Door one. And I just happened to be get it, lucky that I married a guy who was into 
running the pond and putting in the water plants and taking care of it and the pumps and all that stuff. I would have no idea. Um, but the point was that this was kind of a larger home on kind of a larger corner lot. And so we could have something that was nine feet across and, you know, and the, and the fountain was flowing toward the front door. I'm kind of standing near the front door looking at this. It's a significant water feature. You want it to be in balance with, here's the millennial garden again, you know, lovely. You want it to be in proportion with the house and yard. The next house, and I'll show you a picture of, we had a much smaller water feature in front because it is a much smaller house, smaller garden. So you want it to be in proportion. Round or oval shaped, and if it's like a kidney shaped curve toward the house, if you get fish, like again, getting into the weeds with it, multiples of nine, eight red and one black fish. Again, we could go on and on. This is in Shanghai, uh, the Yu Yuan Garden in Shanghai. So these zigzag bridges you've probably seen pictures of, they're also re referred to as a nine turn bridge. And it's just very common in classic Feng Shui gardens. So the idea is that evil spirits don't know how to turn corners. <laughs> I'm not sure who figured that out, but they can't really, they have to just go in a straight line. And so if it curves, then you've out, you've outsmarted the evil spirits and they can't get to you. Um, also, they're really decorative. <laughs> um, and it also kind of it fits into the principle, kind of the Zen or Buddhist principle of mindfulness that you really need to walk along and pay attention to where you're going because you can't just walk in a straight line or you'll end up in the drink. So uh in the forbidden city water it's very specific how the how it flows it's very fun to have a feng shui lecture up in the forbidden city to find out um how they did that and the idea to keep enhance the wealth and power of the emperor of course it ran out of steam at some point so this <laughs> this is the fountain in the next house we lived in that was so so much smaller see it's a much smaller thing because this was between the front porch and the walkway going up to the house so it's the size of a bird bath and so that's just kind of the point of having it be um, in proportion if you can't have water that's okay there you can have symbolic water you can have a water feature that's just like a dry bed um and having these dark gray stones lower maintenance beautiful movement you want to have a curving path you want to have a way to get around your garden and northern gardener loved this in 2004 had a whole whole article about having walkways in your garden and i love that so you just need a way to get around it can be these giant flagstones and tiny gravel like at the hawaii hotel in hawaii also there or it can be a path of lawn or it can be a worn away path, or it can be wood chips. It doesn't matter. It doesn't have to be expensive, but you want to have a way to get around your garden. It could be paving stones. It could be a labyrinth. I'm a big fan. That's also at the Plymouth Millennial Garden, if you like labyrinths. You can have a, a hand-placed stone walkway that was done dynasties ago. <laughs> You want to have a mountain. Okay, this is not so much of a typical Minnesota concept. In Chinese philosophy, in feng shui, we want to have a mountain to support us. You want to have something higher in the back. So the idea is that, and really your house, your house faced the south where the sun was, and you're backed up to the north where there's a mountain. And that helped protect you from the Mongolians coming over the hill to attack you. So there's a lot of practicality and common sense involved in this, but the idea is that having something higher in the back is supportive, that you're backed up, so to speak. So again, the metaphors, we like you to have a headboard that's tall. We like you to have a chair at your desk that's got a high enough back to support you. So it's a theme that runs through feng shui. Now, here we are in Minnesota, not a lot of mountains. Your mountains can be, well, is this anybody's cabin up north here? <laughs> it's actually in Switzerland. <laughs> um, it's perfect landform feng shui that's kind of an armchair position, higher in the back, elevated on the sides, one's higher than the other. Out front is the, the beautiful area, the chi, the water. Okay. Um, this is also in Shanghai again. So they would build a mountain out of boulders and some kind of rice water glue that lasts for centuries. 
And so this is this is in literally in the middle of the city of Shanghai, and it's just an oasis. Another handmade mountain. This is out um, in a different part of China. It is, this one's got the curving path, the water, and the mountain all in one. So, but maybe what you got are trees. A lot of times our trees are our mountain in the back. They're protecting us. They're keeping us safe. They're backing us up. So lots of times here in the Midwest, we've got trees and shrubs, and it can even be symbolic if it has to be. If what you got is something that's not taller than your house, that's okay. You, you just can have that, can be that symbolic, have your intention. Sometimes you can add lights. So maybe landscape lights pointing up into a tree or into the bushes even can help add that energy. We want a place to sit. Again, you, we want you to be able to be in your garden, not just working the garden, which I'm guessing a lot of people just tend to keep working and never sit and enjoy it. So we want you to be able to sit, my friend, um, home in Duluth, where she, she was there for many years. So many wonderful, just great use of ways to sit and be, enjoy the garden. Um, even the chipmunk, you know, felt mm -hmm. comfortable in Lynn's backyard garden. We want to have meaningful treasures. Now, this is where some of the fun comes in, too. In our family, we have a saying that we never met a stone we didn't love. Mm -hmm. um, and so we brought, I don't know how many pounds of rocks from California after my, anyway. Um, <laughs> but it could be that the meaningful treasure is the Buddha to you. So it could be the stone or the Buddha. You decide what is meaningful to you and what you want in your garden. Now, here's my list of feng shui flowers and trees and their meanings. But I have to say, these are mostly Asian, Asian sourced flowers and trees. Some of them have their native uh, affiliates like lilies, water lilies, pine trees or evergreens. So lots of them have, we have our native ones. But these in China, in feng shui, we have symbolic meanings for these things. When I've looked at native plants, I know that there are really important uses for lots of native plants. There are uses that the native peoples used. I haven't found a lot of meaning in the same way in, what, in the research I've done. I think that we all add our meaning. You know, we may plant echinacea because, because it's beautiful and because it's good for the environment and because it represents healing to us because it's got all kinds of healing properties. So that's just one example. Um, the peony represents love and relationship, chrysanthemums. We have plants like that, happiness and laughter. They're just kind of they are the sort of nobility because they bloom at the end of the end of the season. Um, bulbs in general are considered just to be buried treasure. Um, so for buried gold. Lilies are aristocrats on their good feng shui. The water lily, the water lily is really the, the, the jewel. The Buddha was called, said to be the jewel in the lotus. So it's such a beautiful, beautiful flower that grows up out of the mud and the muck um, that it's, it's the most spiritual flower. Pine trees, longevity, fidelity, faithfulness. So you get the idea that these things are important. And this is where I want you to bring your, your expertise in the prairie plants and what's symbol symbolic to you, um, it, it bring that to bear. Sometimes what's important to you, what's symbolic to you is the, simply the color. You love that color purple or that color blue. Um, sometimes it's that specific plant uh, that you love and what it means. When you're shopping for meaningful treasures in Tibet, you probably go to the ancient things store. <laughs> I guess that's their translation for antiques. It could be <laughs> sculptures. Uh, sometimes your treasures are your critters, and those might be fish. Uh, it might be the your dragon boat, like the Empress Dowager had at the Summer Palace. Uh, again, it might be something that's a feature that has beautiful craft work to it, and that often is what we love and treasure in our gardens, and that can be all kinds of opportunities um, to, to use things like that. And have a treasured humorous sign about not pissing off the fairies, the wee folk. 
Okay, you want to have a guardian. This is another concept that I wouldn't have heard until I studied feng shui. You want to have a guardian of some kind. Again, many personalities, lots of different kinds. So I'll just give you some images of things that could be a guardian, whether it's a, a snow lion, snow leopard from uh, Thailand, something uh, from a ship. The Ming tombs are near Beijing, and there is a four-mile path of guardian statues going to protect the 13 emperors that are enshrined in the Ming tombs. So you could have that on your street. <laughs> and here's me and my feng shui girlfriends. Wow. Yeah. Oh. Oh my gosh. Well, um, I can do it in a few minutes. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks. Um, okay. You get the idea of those critters you want to have a secret area so the point there is you don't want to give it all away just from looking at from the street at your garden might be a sunken area might be something around the corner or in the back and you want to have a fence or a boundary you don't have to have a literal fence necessarily like they do in shanghai um but you might want to have a tree line or uh, just an open fence line you want to have that boundary because you want to know this is my space and this is the rest this is my internal world and my external world this is my garden and not my garden can be so simple this was just in scotland so feng shui is really an ancient system of common sense i think you're keeping your back protected you having a visible and inviting entryway you have gently rolling land, sunny exposure, good water. You know, when they forced Indians onto reservations, what did they look for? They looked for good exposure and good land and places where there were lots of animals to live. They, they wanted those things to keep themselves um, surviving. Keeping the space clean and uncluttered and making it beautiful so it expresses who you are. So just holding on to what, what intentions do I have for my garden and my space? At the end of all my talks here, I use this quote from T.S. Eliot, which I found painted on a giant wall at NASA in Florida, which amazed me. We shall not cease from exploration. And the end of all our exploring will be to arrive where we started and know the place for the first time. And I just, I love that about feng shui, that you'll go home and you'll, tomorrow, you'll look at your garden starting tomorrow and see it with feng shui eyes, with different eyes. And you'll be looking now, you'll be, you won't be able to stop looking at people's front doors. It will drive you crazy, <laughs> including your own front door <laughs> and your garage's front door. So we just, you might carry some of this with you to make some adjustments to your home and garden. Um, and I am happy to answer questions. <clears throat> yes. I've got a one minute on trade. I used to do a lot of photography for a color and brand. It's a color of design equipment company. Yes. And uh, somehow I got over to China, went up a river, stayed at a place, and uh, was we were going through where they made the various departments, whether uh, we don't hear it there in the bases and full, you call them full flower, they cost more. So, uh, I was commissioned to take pictures of each station, yeah. but the story was they built this addition and they hired a functioning master to point it in the correct direction, like yes. That. So on the opening day of television, guess what? It rained. That was not good. We had too much rain in the wrong place. So they hired another function master and they, they moved it so many degrees. I'm not sure how many. Oh my God. But that's uh, oh my God. So the big deal. Yes. Yes. Hi. And, the story. and the directions, the compass directions are very important. And again, all these principles apply to the compass directions too. Um, and everybody, like you each have four good directions and four not good directions. And that's based on your birth year. I'm, we're looking for a house right now. And I'm telling you, feng shui adds a whole 
stack of variables that complicate finding a house <laughs> so much. Um, and it, it, the whole city of um, Hong Kong, you know, it's the banks would build these big pointy things going at the next bank to send bad energy to the next bank. And then the next one would build. I mean, when you read about these things, it's fascinating. It is absolutely fascinating. And I do know of a, I was teaching um, at a class at the U and the, at the Center for Spirituality and Healing. And one of the, a woman in the back who was, I think Chinese origin, she said that her grandfather, I think it was, died in New York, whenever, however long ago. And that the family believed that that was, he was buried there because he died there. That that was such bad luck that they dug him up and moved his body back to be buried in China because of the, you know, the feng shui aspect of it. So the, these things are very important to the people, these cultures. What else? Yes. You know, um, as, a, as a long time asylum member, yeah. what, when we look at space, uh, outdoor spaces, we have to think of how does this provide habitat? Yes. Okay, so the people at home can't hear the okay. question, so we have to really change up how we're doing things here. Okay. You, you either need to repeat the question or you need to use a mic. Okay, oh. let's do that. Pretty much the mission of wild ones is to. It's like an ice cream to, cone. Is to look at the landscapes, uh, spaces, green spaces, and do they provide habitat? And a lot of the resources you're talking about provide habitat. Yeah. Is there a, a piece of feng shui that integrates that sort of concept too? So the so the question of does feng shui really does it talk about adding to habitat or providing habitat? I guess I would say that I don't remember hearing it put in that way. But as you commented, I think it fits the principles. You know, we for sure want it to support habitat, and much of the time we're focused on the habitat of the human beings. I mean, that's what we're looking at is. Am I healthy? Am I like, do we have the, all these life, the parts of life we're talking about in the Bagua? But at the same time, um, a feng shui consultant will look at land and say, everything's dead here, nothing's growing, there's some bad chi. Now, it might be the direction of the water. It, there could be a lot of feng shui reasons for that, but that would not be good feng shui then. So I think in that way, yes, the habitat is, yeah, included. Um, I'm going to kind of bring us back to something you said at the very beginning. Yeah. I don't know if people at home can hear me or not. Can Vicki, can you tell me if people at home can hear me? Nodding. I reset the microphone so that it was picking up the room. So you were talking earlier about clutter. Yes, and clutter. You talked about cleaning up gardens. Yes, and yes. And of course, all, every one of us in the room says we're taught not to raise the leaves. We're taught not to right. clean up clutter because clutter is like yes so how do we incorporate that feeling of feng shui but still allow for clutter being like like uh that dead branch that's yes. laying there yes, that yes. is providing habitat exactly. for insects yeah. so can we can we take that feng shui idea and like i have a pile of logs mm -hmm. in my garden yeah that is a focal point, but it is also energy and light. So yes. how could we incorporate that and that not cleaning up the garden right. but still have that function? I, lo I love that. One of the comments that I blew through um, when I was trying to hurry up is it, just the idea of it, it really is about your intention and what's important to you. So when, um, when we're looking at um, representing what's representing in your life the compost pile so for some people a compost pile is rotting gunk and for a lot of us gardeners the compost pile is gold being created and so i think that in and of itself is you decide what is what it means what those aspects of your garden mean and that pile of logs may be just it must be a castle 
for all the critters that can be living there. So I really think a lot of it is in the interpretation of it. And then, you know, I mean, clutter's in the eye of the beholder, I suppose. Um, so you don't want your neighbors calling the city on you, but. <laughs> um, yeah, and that's the pathways and the intention. You know, exactly. you, don't, you don't want the clutter in your front yard. You know, exactly. You know, in a space that is, in a different space that's in right. your yard. Exactly, exactly, yeah. Um, I just want to say is that you can make that debris in those logs and aesthetic, and that's that's what I try to do at in my yard. And there's a, those accused maintenance mm -hmm. that you can do, so it it can work. And thinking about fences too, also with habitat. Sometimes you um, like I'm connecting our habitat to our neighbors. And things yes, like that, so uh -huh. it's a different kind of a a flow. The other question I had is is um, when you put the it's, it's the bagua yes uh -huh, the, bagua. on top of the property, you could have it go um, turn it around anyway. Is there a, like a, a, a south a, a front and a the front and the back? So in traditional feng shui, um, the the what I showed as the bottom, the career area is the north, is always north, and the fame and reputation, the red area, the fire area is always south. So that's the traditional way to do it in feng shui. And that's being that we live where we live with all the streets are mostly north, south, east, west. It, that can be kind of easy. But but you don't ever put the that front part, the career part facing east. You don't do that. It's always north, south. Or in the more contemporary way you do, that's the front of the property and the back of the property. And so you don't you can't turn it like oh well I like it this direction because that's the side way no it has to be the front the architecturally intended front of the property yeah what are any other questions here yes one more oh okay Um, I was curious, so my house has a porch and a porch on the front of it, and then you have to go through that to get to the front door. Wait, say it again, it has a what? Porch, the three season. Oh, the yeah, 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 uh-huh. So would my front door be considered the door to the porch, or the door after the porch? Uh -huh. Oh, and there's so many of those, right? Um, I would say that both of them are important. Okay. And so that front door... Um, the, so the question is, uh, in terms of front doors, when you have a, a, a four season porch, you have that front porch on front of the house, but then it kind of is like the nice front door, the real front door is inside there. Um, they're both important. And so because what those opportunities that are tripping down the road, trying to find you see is that outside front door. And if they can't see your front door, they don't aren't attracted to it, they might just go keep going. So you want to attract those opportunities. That's what we call it the mouth of chi or the, up the, the, where your opportunities come to you. But also that other door is important too. And so you have, to, yeah, just, you, you they're can, both. You can do a bagua on the porch. You can do a separate bagua on the porch. Exactly. Thank you all so much. I will stick around for more questions later, but thank you all. <laughs>